All right, it's Jordan Sanchez here from Revolution 935, and I have the pleasure to sit down with a basketball and DJ legend. It's former center for the Miami Heat. In fact, he was the Miami Heat's first ever draft pick ever. Also played with Golden State, Orlando, the Nets, and the NBA. Today, he is known as a DJ and music producer. You might even know him as the host of Sugar Free Radio. Please welcome Ronnie Cycli. What's up, Ronnie? Hey, hey, everything is great, man. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be sitting down here with you. By the way, I, not not as a flex, I'm just saying you're not the first former Miami Heat center I, I've ever interviewed. By the way, <laughs> not a flex, just just uh, just it's it's kind of ironic because I, I actually got to interview uh, Shaquille O'Neal back in high school. So uh, uh, it's it's a pleasure to be sitting here with with you today. Well, that's awesome because Shaq is also like, you know, a, a, a kind of closet DJ, like, uh, you know, plays the EDM trap uh, music. So you've nailed the two centers that actually uh, love music. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Pretty ironic considering I, I'm also a DJ as well. So it, it, I, I, I'm a big, uh, big basketball guy. Uh, it, it's good to sit with, uh, with you here. Let's begin with your nickname, by the way, Ronnie, The Spin Doctor. Was that something given to you when people knew you were already a DJ, or was that a nickname exclusively dealing with your basketball skills? No, I had nothing to do with the DJing career. It's basically, you know, that uh, back in the 90s uh, when I played, big men had to play with their back to the baskets, and that's that's where you kind of park yourself, and that's where you get your opportunities is uh, with your back to the basket. So I, had, I developed the game uh, down low that uh, – you know, watching Akeem Olajuwon and all those uh, amazing players play and the way they just kind of spin off of people. You feel the body, you spin one way, you spin the other. <clears throat> and um, I got I got to a point where I was really good at it. So uh, they coined the, the spin doctor. And, um, you know, hello, <laughs> 20 years later, here I am as a spin doctor spinning, um, spinning music. That's amazing that you didn't even have to change your nickname and, and it's pretty apropos. <laughs> yeah, amazing. amazing. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of your playing days, when, when you were playing in the locker room, would you blast house music? No, house music was not allowed in the locker room. I would <laughs> I would always blast house music in my car. Okay. And, you know, when, when other players would come out, kind of like, you know, if we get to, to, to practice or to the games at the same time and, and my music is is blasting in the car, they'll just look at me as like, Sai, come on, turn that shit off, man. <laughs> well, which, which teammates were the ones that teased you the most? All of them. I, I, never, <laughs> I, I actually never had a teammate that said oh i kind of like this let's uh let me hear some more no it was like oh come on let's turn this off and put some real music on <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious now, now when you would listen to house music would that like get you in the zone for a, a game or was that something that you did on your own listen it, it you know i've i've been exposed to a lot of music in my life and since i was a little kid and uh and you know, house music always resonated to me. It was something that uh, that uh, I felt, and so to me, I, I, anytime I, I, I put uh, music uh, on, and specifically house music and stuff like that, it was always kind of like a a uh, more of a therapy for me, more of a meditation kind of thing. It takes me to places and stuff like that. I loved hearing music. I didn't know uh, just to see where the story goes and. And I was always curious about, you know, going and seeing uh, DJs play uh, music that I've never heard, just so I can, uh, you know, it's just so I, it opens up my horizons. And, you know, I didn't want to hear the same song that everybody's singing and dancing to. That is not what I wanted. I wanted something that nobody else was. Uh, I wanted to hear new stuff all the time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel like as a musician, that's kind of something we all share in common. And uh, it's nice to hear that 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 actually was something that was a part of your life, even though basketball was a big part of your life as well. It's cool that you were able to balance that. Uh, I did want to touch on some of the music th things, your background in music, but I also wanted to touch a little bit more on some of the basketball stuff. Now, the reason why I asked you about listening to the music before games and stuff like that, I, I wanted to know what got you in the zone. Because like when you start a game, you got to go up against the big man of the opposing team uh, right off the bat. When you're doing the jump ball, you're there facing him one-to-one, one-on-one. Now, what was the guy that when posting up, like you had to DM up in the post, what was the guy that you hated doing that to? Like, what was the guy that was ding up against you knew oh man i'm gonna have a tough night defending this guy 
Well, I'll tell you one thing. Once you get, once you make it to the NBA, every night is a tough night. And especially in the 90s when every team was stacked and every team had their big man. You know, back then, now in today's world, everybody's, you know, kind of playing outside, inside. Back then, you know, every night you had to go up against, I would give up at least three, four inches and 20, 30 pounds every single night. So there was no easy night for me. It was everything I had to come in and, 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 and make sure that I played as hard as I could because I know I was, uh, you know, outweighed and and sometimes um, uh, taller than me. So you know they, but there are nights where I would say, okay, this is an easier night yeah. than the next night. But in 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 act, you know, in, in actual, it's never easy. Yeah, for definitely, I hear you. Especially in the, like, like you said in the '90s where everybody it was like there was a bad boy image in the NBA. The big guys were tough. That must have been. Uh, uh, a rough, uh, a rough outing for you when, when you went out there. But. It, it, like you know, you, if you have Shaquille O'Neal uh, come up for a game tomorrow, and then you got Akeem Olajuwon the game after, and then you got Patrick Ewing the game after, and then you got David Robinson and Tim Duncan the game after, and then you had Mark Eaton, uh, rest in peace, Mark Eaton, who's seven foot four, two hundred or three hundred pounds. And then you had, uh, you know, uh, just uh, Brad Darty. Everybody, in, every team had their big center. So, you know, I would say like, okay, he's not a large one, so I got to go up against Patrick tonight. How? What am I going to do to to make his life miserable tonight? <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a tough uh, a tough task. And I, by the way, I feel you don't get enough credit for this, but you truly were one of the originals, the OGs of the first wave of European players in the NBA. Uh, although you did play college ball in Syracuse, uh, so I'm curious, how did the American game differ from what you grew up playing, and how did playing college ball in upstate New York help with that transition? Well, first of all, I mean, you know, people take it for granted that you've got European players uh, in the league and in playing college. When I came to the U.S., I was pretty much... I mean, I have to explain to people where Europe was. Like, you know, people will tell me, where are you from? And I'll say, I'm from, let's say, you know, if I say Lebanon or Greece or anywhere, they'll be like, what? And I'll say, yeah, it's overseas. So my story just stuck to, where are you from? I'm from overseas. And they don't, it's just kind of blank because people didn't even know where I was from. And, uh, and fast forward, you know, 30 years, you've got, a, <laughs> you've got amazing uh, basketball players that have, uh, have uh, come across the pond and, and made an, an impact in, in their own rights. So I feel like I'm the pioneer when it comes to, uh, um, you know, for, for foreigners to come, especially from where I came from. Uh, it, it was, it's just a, a dream that never, uh, comes true because the NBA and college ball was just such an, uh, an, a higher level than what we've seen in Europe that, uh, you know, it was just a, a dream. And I just went after it and I went after my dream. And that's, you know, it's, and, and that's, how, that's how I got it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, you seem to settle in nicely after basketball life. You know, lots of times you hear stories of athletes finding the transition after sports to be a little bit tough. Uh, and, you know, the passion and dedication isn't necessarily there to nurture an athlete's career. It's hard to find somewhere else. But for you, you seem to channel that passion into music and DJing. So why do you think you've been able to excel in music after excelling in basketball? And how are music and basketball different? Um, I think that, well, so, you know, it's, it's many uh, questions in one uh, <laughs> question. So, uh, I think that... Um, Playing in the NBA, coming from Europe, I knew that I was on borrowed time. I knew that I don't, I'm not sure if I could make it. I'm not sure if I could stick. I got to work hard. Then I always had in the back, in the rear view mirror, if I have an injury, what am, what's my plan B here? I'm not going into this with my eyes closed thinking that I'm going to be here forever. I'm always thinking like, uh, you know, one foot in the door, one foot out the door. And, once, and if things change, what am I going to do? And... Honestly, uh, music was, is a passion. Music was not a source of income for me. So I didn't think that I was going to just jump on and become a DJ and, and make money touring, stuff like that. That is exactly what I did not want to do after an NBA career. What I did want to do is make sure that, you know, I start a business and start doing things that are going to carry me for the rest of my life. You know, when you're an athlete or a DJ or, you know, no, your career is so short. So... I didn't want to go from one short career to another short career. I wanted to establish myself uh, as, as a business person and, and to be able to 
live out my passions, but not have to rely on it as a source of income. Right. Well, that, that, it's it's incredible to hear you say it like that because people are often surprised when when someone like you, an athlete, someone who's who's popular or famous in the basketball realm, is also a prolific DJ and music producer. But a lot of times, these passions are cultivated over time, like behind the scenes. And I'm sure uh, you had this passion. You kind of touched upon it while you were playing. So, when did house music and DJing come into your life? I started playing house. I mean, don't forget that house music. Basically, you know, we, house music started as disco music, right? And disco music morphed into house music. So, I started. I had a club in my house when we were living in Greece in my parents' garage, and I was 14 years old. And I had the turntables. I had a club in the house, and I would play music for, uh, you know, visiting basketball teams, and and you know, couldn't, we couldn't go out and stuff like that. So I would DJ for as 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 a hobby. And, you know, I would charge a couple of dollars here and there and upgrade the system, upgrade the lights. So this this DJing thing has been in my blood since I was 14 years old. Nothing's changed. Throughout the NBA, I always had a room in my house where I would go and play music and DJ for my friends. So this has was never supposed to be something that is brought to the public. This was something that I did for my friends, for myself. And something that I loved. I make music, I play the music, and I was supposed to, you know, was never supposed to be out for the public. Eric Murillo used to come to my house, uh, and he has passed away, obviously, since yeah. uh, uh, last year. And, and he was a, a, a huge uh, instrumental person in my life. Back in 2004, 2003, he was the king of Ibiza at the time, playing, you know, his style of music. And he would come and listen to me play, and he would always tell me, Ronnie, you have a specific sound, and I think that you need to play out. You need to let people hear you. And I said, Eric, I don't know, man. You know, I just finished the NBA. I'm not really – I don't want people to judge me based on – you know, I don't want to go through this whole judgment on what's this guy doing, you know, why is he jumping from this to this. And – you know, this is something that I love. And he said, nah, it's a shame if you don't. And he used to label some of his songs on his CDs as uh, these are Ron like Ronnie style, Ronnie style, Ronnie style. So he coined kind of the Ronnie style back in 2003. And I started making music for him and Subliminal uh, around 2010. But it's not the music that I really loved. It's the music that they wanted. Mm -hmm. And... At the time, you know, I started realizing that, you know, every time I make music and I send it out, labels just said, you know, this is good, but it's not for us. This doesn't fit in our catalog. Um, so the rejection uh, year after year after year after year of me trying to kind of carve a niche for my sound and myself has been a nightmare. I mean, people think that this is, has been an easy uh, road, but it has definitely not been an easy road. There's been a million times where I've, you know, people have said, yeah, but no, you know, yes, but no, yes, but no. And just because there was this basketball uh, kind of um, uh, basketball um, that was tied to my name, people just did not want to accept the fact that this guy knows music or He's got his own style of music and let's give him a chance based on the music and not based on who he was uh, as a basketball player, because every, just nobody wanted to give me that credibility and the credit of being of, of doing what I, I'm doing without having to tag the basketball player. So it wasn't it was a very, very difficult transition. And that's exactly what I did not want to happen. And that's why I told, told Eric, I didn't want I didn't care what you know, like. Let, let's put a few DJs behind closed curtain and let's let them play music and let's hear the music and not judge based on who they are or who they were in their previous lives. You know what I mean? So uh, it hasn't been easy, but I stuck to it because this is something that I love and I do it out of passion and I do it because I love it. I don't do it for the money. It, I don't care whether I play out. I don't care if I tour. I pick and choose the places where I play, whether they pay, they don't pay. I do this because I love it. I do it because 
I'm passionate about music. I'm passionate about making the music. And I'm passionate because I have my own style. I don't follow anybody. I don't copy anybody. This is all me and stuff that I, I'm feeling. So that's my story. <laughs> Wow, that was amazing. The the part that really struck me was you saying how you've been rejected by labels, and I feel like producers and DJs all have that in common. And it goes to show you, like how you said, just because you have basketball attached to your name doesn't mean that you got to skip to the front of the line. You actually had to put in the work like everybody else, and that's an amazing story. And I actually remember seeing you at some subliminal parties, which uh, blew my mind because I was I first and foremost, foremost thought of you as a basketball player. And when I saw you, you know, break it down at a subliminal party, I was I was shocked. Uh, and I've seen you at, at various venues, but what is your favorite venue all around the world and here in Miami? Well, obviously, club space in Miami is number one. I think it's it's become the mecca of of uh, dance music. I think that uh, uh, the way that's, you know, the way it's configured, the way the, the energy is all, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very uh, special club. There's another club in, in, um, in Lebanon that I used to play called The Garten, which had a similar feel, but it was all outdoors instead of kind of a uh, indoor-outdoor kind of thing. So those, those the, you know, the, the other clubs are the usual, Amnesia and Ibiza, those are mega clubs. Um, there's a lot of clubs that are great clubs and stuff like that. But the ones that I enjoy playing the most, and this is why I'm telling you that this is this is something that I do because I love doing it. I just, you know, I, 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 I play some shitty dive bars in Detroit and in Chicago and places like this where they, you know, it costs me more money to fly to the gig than to actually uh, make money. And, and, and I do it because I love it. I love it. I want people to experience my sound and I do it, you know, and, 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 and not have to worry about playing all these mega clubs and, and having to change my sound because they want more champagne popping and I got to play a little more commercial. No, I'm playing what I play and that's it. If you don't want to hear what I got, you know, then don't book me. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's spoken like a true DJ. Uh, and by the way, I really appreciate you being so candid and so honest. And I did want to touch upon uh, that human side of Ronnie Cycli. Uh, you know, being a beloved member of the Miami community, uh, well, not really just the Miami community, but the basketball and DJ communities as well. I think a lot of people that follow you or know you, they tend to associate you with fond memories. I know people that associate with you with like legendary parties that you DJ that they had amazing times at. For me, uh, you were the first basketball player that I could never, I could ever name. And you were also my favorite basketball player that I could choose in NBA Jam back in the day, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of memories that are attached to you from other people uh, have like deep Deeper, uh, uh, deeper, uh, are deeper. You're, you know, there's a more human side of you that they attach to. And the first thing I can remember about that was the time when you played one on one with Magic Johnson after his HIV diagnosis, which of course speaks volumes. But of course, you showed your deeper human side after the tragic explosion in your hometown in Beirut. Uh, in an age where expression by public figures like you is often associated with like being fake or being commercial or being manufactured, uh, why do you think like how you express yourself is so authentic, and why do you do that? Why do you do it that way? Why do you show your human side? I, I don't know. I think I, I grew up, and uh, you know, I grew up um, in a family where uh, your foundation uh, is the most important thing, and who you are as a person, uh, you have to stick to being true to yourself and true to others. And you have to be real. Uh, there's too many fake people and too many, uh, you know, sh uh, this, this, sh I look at the industry, I look at the basketball players, I look at everybody's kind of cultivated to do what they got to do to do. But I don't go by that. I just go by how real it is. Some people may think that I'm offensive by being so real, but this is the way I know how to be. I just don't, don't know how to sugarcoat things. I, I'll tell you the honest truth, and that's what I feel. And I think that sometimes that has hurt me um, in, in, uh, in, in growing up uh, because they thought that it's a little too abrupt or whatever. But, you know, I just stay true to who I am as a person. And if, and if uh, you know, once you get to know me, once you understand who I am as a person, you'll understand that what you see is what you get. And that, you know, there is no sugarcoating. There is no nothing. And I am... Um, I've got, I know that I've got my, my two feet on the floor. Uh, basketball is something that I love doing 
but I don't, I don't kind of, I don't have an ego because I'm a basketball player. I don't have an ego because I'm a DJ. I'm just like everybody else that has God given talent and I'm cultivating this talent that God has given me to do, to give people joy, to give people smiles, but I'm not special in any way. God has made me special and given me these talents. So I'm as real I'm, and, and I'm just like everybody else, man. Yeah, definitely. And, and let's let's talk about those talents. Let's talk about uh, your musical prowess. Uh, uh, you have an amazing rework out now, a track uh, called It's a Lovely Day, and it samples one of my favorite songs of all time by w Bill Withers. Tell me about how that came about. This, this, is, uh, uh, this song uh, gets played by my wife probably every other day. Uh, <laughs> every other day. And um, so um, I, I said, you know what? Maybe I could, I could mix this to uh to make it more of a housey track so i can play it out and that's how it started so i started you know playing with it and tinkering with it and then turned it into a kind of a, a more housey version of uh, of what the original was and uh made my wife very happy <laughs> that's awesome that's a great story I, I love that your wife was the motivation uh behind that track <laughs> uh, uh speaking of music though also we have more music more new music on the way safari is coming out tell me about that listen i have so much music <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> I, I make so much music and i love making so much music i'm you know uh, I, this i have the album coming out and this is one of the first tracks that's coming uh, that's, uh, that's off the album. I wanted to do a dance album, not a, an artistic album, but more of a dance album. Mm -hmm. People are going to, you know, you can put that, uh, that track list and, and just kind of dance for a couple of hours. And that's what I wanted to do. So this is one of the first tracks that's being released. It is, um, I called it Safari because for me, my music and the way... I do my music is I try to build a story into every track that I make. And I felt that this is a safari. It's like, an, like a, a hunt of where we're going with this track and what's going on and how we can have the elements of surprise. So I named this track just from the feeling of where I was at when I was making the music versus what the real song means. You, you know what I mean? Like, I'm yeah. not taking some of the vocals of the track and, and naming it after the vocal. I'm naming it of, of how I felt doing this track. So I was like on a safari looking for different things. And, you know, I, was, I felt like I was in, in an adventure trying to find things and different sounds and, and where am I going with this? And, and I felt like it was more of a safari, like uh, an adventure. Uh, that, that sounds awesome. I mean, if anyone tells you that, that an athlete or a basketball player is, is not deep or not smart, they, they got to listen to you, man, because you're, you're going deep into it. And I love that project. And uh, speaking of the album, this project, uh, I heard there's like a, 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 some surprises in this album that people can expect. Uh, can you talk, talk about that? I mean, there's plenty of great, great surprises. I've got some great uh, remixes. Um, I've got some, not remixes, but I've had, I have... Uh, I've used uh, uh, Diddy's um, uh, voice. Uh, we wanted to. We've been talking about making the track together for many, many, many years. Uh, Diddy has always come to, you know, also one of the guys that would come to the house and listen to me play, and, and um, he knows how how deep the music runs in my veins. So uh, I asked him to do a track together, and uh, and he said absolutely. So I ended up doing a couple of tracks. Uh, with his uh, with his vo vocals, and then uh, I have another track called "The Last Dance." Um, I call that track "The Last Dance" because of the Michael Jordan uh, documentary on ESPN, "The Last Dance." So I felt that uh, you know I always try to kind of throw in some basketball stuff into my music, just to kind of mm, have uh, have that that con connection that is truly my connection. So. Um, the last dance, I used Michael Jordan's um, a vocal uh, sample where he was at Kobe Bryant's um, uh, uh, eulogy, and uh, and he was talking about how you know uh, uh, about how we should love one another and 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 take care of each other and stuff like that. That you know that life can go 
in a, in a nanosecond and you're gone, right? So I used a snippet of his eulogy to put into a track called The Last Dance. And obviously, nobody's going to know it's Michael Jordan's voice, but I do. And that's... Wow. <laughs> Yeah, so it's um, it's really a nice one. Well, if they listen to this interview, they're definitely going to know that's Michael Jordan's voice now. So that's that's pretty cool. A little Easter egg for the listeners out there. Now, if anyone wanted to know about any upcoming music, any upcoming gigs, I know you're having a celebration for your releases uh, uh, at Space, right? I, I read it on your Twitter. You're going to be at Space this weekend. Yes, playing wow. at Space, my, one of my favorite clubs in the world. And uh, it's always a, a great, great night when I play at Space. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that one. Oh, that's going to be amazing. I, I'm going to make it out there to check that out for sure. But if uh, people wanted to know about your music, where can they find you on social media and all that good stuff? Well, on, um, obviously, on uh, m music is on Beatport. Uh, music is... Uh, uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Ronnie Cycle. You can follow me on Twitter. You can follow me on any of the social media stuff. Plus, um, you know, YouTube. If you want to listen to that remix I did, uh, the Bill Withers uh, remix is on YouTube. Uh, that's done so well. You know, in less than probably ten days, we've had almost four or five hundred thousand listeners. So that's amazing. Um, you know, you can uh, you just Google my name and just don't go to the basketball section. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I actually, when I was a kid, I used to go and do the uh, the Wikipedia's of all the Miami Heat ba uh, basketball players. And I I'm pretty sure I did some entries for yours. So uh, uh, people are still going to remember your name, obviously, for the basketball stuff. But I hope uh, you make your mark with music because it certainly sounds like something you're really passionate about. And, uh, and, and you're actually good at it, which is the best part, right? So if you want to go check out Ronnie Cycli, spin some tunes at Space. He'll be there this Friday. And make sure you check out his new album, Dropping Safari. Also drops this weekend. Am I right about that, Ronnie? Yes. All right. Drops so tomorrow. Yeah, definitely. Safari drops as well this weekend. And check out that It's Lovely Day little rework, little track that he did on YouTube. Once again, I'm so excited. I'm, I'm still excited. And we're wrapping up this interview. But thank you so much, Ronnie, for sitting down with me. Uh, I had a blast with you, man. You guys are doing a great job. Keep that music, that, that, that house music alive. You already know. And I'll see you at space, dude. Thank you so much. You. you got it. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.